Hi everyone and welcome to this, our fourth and actually our final remote learning lesson for GCSE PE. As promised, uh, this presentation will include the four topic areas that we've yet to cover in lesson time. Um, obviously with it being four topic areas, I'm going to try and keep it as brief and concise as possible so you're not going to get too bored and this video is not going to go on forever. So we're going to look at mental prep and rehearsal, engagement patterns, commercialization and media, and ethical and social cultural issues. So without further ado, we'll start with our first one, which is mental preparation and rehearsal in sport. So mental preparation and rehearsal is a psychological technique, so it's all related to the brain. And it's something that athletes use to achieve their optimum level of performance. It can be something which happens prior to them actually performing, which is something used to improve motivation or focus. It can be something that you use during a performance where you visualize a skill or a movement before you actually do it. And it's something that can be used to reduce anxiety levels, which again will hopefully allow you to produce the best performance you have. So the difference between mental preparation and rehearsal is the following. Mental preparation is about getting you ready to produce the best possible performance. A lot of athletes use music these days, so listening to headphones and a particular type of music before they compete. You might have a bit of something called self-talk, which is where you talk in your own head about what you're going to do. And it can also be seen most frequently when teams do huddles before, during, in a break, within the performance. So mental preparation is about preparing. Mental rehearsal is about the athlete actually visualizing the movement in their head before they perform it. And this often takes place just before they're about to do the skill or whilst the skill is taking place. And as we can see here, Johnny Wilkinson is a prime candidate for that. He was well renowned for visualizing the skill of kicking a ball through the posts before doing it. And he didn't do too bad. So, an exam question for this might state, how may a high jump athlete use mental preparation and rehearsal to improve their performance? Where three marks, and as you know, your preparation and your rehearsal is different. So, bit of a model answer here. Prior to competing, the athlete may listen to music to improve his focus and increase his motivation levels. So you talk about mental prep there and how that improves performance. He could also undertake self-talk or even speak to his coach, which would reduce anxiety, improve confidence, and again, therefore improve performance. So we've got two marks there. The final mark would come from talking about visualizing the technique, which is mental rehearsal. So visualizing the Fosbury flop, visualizing his run up, and again, that would hopefully allow him to improve confidence, rehearse that performance, and hopefully improve what he's about to do. The next topic is engagement patterns and engagement patterns refers to the participation of different groups of people uh, within the UK and the sports that they choose to participate in. For this we're going to look at different trends within five different groups. The five different groups are socio-economic, age, gender, disability and ethnicity. And I'm hopefully going to demonstrate how we can apply the same theory to each one of those groups. So, socioeconomic all refers to how we divide people based on their job, their profession and their subsequent income. So basically how much money you have. The reason that this affects participation um, is primarily down to how much the cost of activities is. Uh, some activities cost more than others to participate in and therefore require a higher income. Availability is also another issue regards to money. Some activities require you to travel around the world and obviously in order to do that you need money. And finally, some activities take a long time and depending on what job you have and what work commitments you have, you might not necessarily be able to participate. So an example of those three, the cost of activities, if you think about horse riding, really expensive, you need a lot of money in order to do that sport. Something like skiing, obviously you've got to travel to a ski resort which can be very expensive. 
And if you think about something like uh, sailing around the world or competing in the America's Cup, which is a big sailing competition, you need a long time in which to, to do that. And again, high amounts of money. So money can have a massive impact on participation. Age. So obviously we're dividing people on how old they are. The first one we're looking at is the nature of the activity in the green box. Some activities are obviously more difficult uh, than others. And depending on your age, whether you are extremely young or elderly, they might be more difficult to participate in. So, for example, a skydive, someone who is really young or really old may not be so inclined to do something like that due to the nature of the activity. The next one is the cost. So, again, depending on how young you are, how old you are, you'll have different financial responsibilities. If you're younger, you might not have the money to go and pay for gym subscriptions or anything like that. Likewise, if you're a bit older and you have family and bills to pay, you might not have the disposable income to pay for sports which require a high amount of money. And lastly, time. So again, younger people like yourselves, you have to attend school and college, which may impact how much time you can do sport for. And likewise, older people may have work and family commitments. And again, those commitments may come ahead of physical activity or sport. Gender. This is dividing people based on their sex, so whether they are male or female. First one we're going to talk about is social acceptance. So some activities, even in this day and age, are considered to be more suited to either a male or a female athlete, which can put people off. And the example we've used here is obviously a male ballet dancer. There would still be some stereotyping or discrimination or social acceptance against male ballet dancers. Opportunities. Um, in many areas across the UK, there's still more sports clubs dedicated to, to males than females. So fewer opportunities exist for girls and women. So, for example, if you think about our area and how many clubs or rugby clubs there are for boys and men compared to how many rugby clubs there are for girls and women, there's a complete disparity between the two. And lastly, stereotyping. Uh, there is still a, a wrongful perception among some that women have to spend more time at home giving birth to children, looking after children and family, looking after the home. Uh, and as I said, that's very much stereotyping, um, but it still exists. And that's why we get a difference in some men participating more in sport than women. The next one is disability. So dividing people based on whether they consider themselves to be able bodied or suffering from a disability. The first one is looking at the facilities and clubs which are available for the different uh, groups of people there. There are a lot more able bodies facilities and clubs than there are for disabled athletes. So that may be a reason why some disabled athletes cannot take part in the sport they want to. Similarly, cost. Um, a number of disabled sports do require very specialist equipment or facilities which can be very expensive to purchase. So the example we've got here is a gentleman skiing and the adaptations in that equipment would be very expensive. And obviously, if you don't have the money, then obviously you're going to struggle to participate. And again, stereotyping uh, features here. Some people, again, have the wrongful perception that disabled people are unable to take part in sport, which can lead to stereotyping and discrimination. And sometimes disabled people feel like they don't want to participate in sport because of that discrimination and stereotyping. And lastly, lastly we have ethnicity. Dividing people based on their culture or specific ethnic group. Now, cultural influences do play a major part in ethnicity. Some religious beliefs or cultural backgrounds uh, can influence what sports some people do. And equally, some cultures, um, for example, uh, also make women wear certain items of clothing, which means that they're going to struggle to participate in certain sports. So obviously, the picture we have here is a young lady who has to cover uh, the vast majority of her body up. So obviously if she wants to do something like swimming, she may have more difficulties in taking up that sport. Unfortunately, stereotyping plays a, another role here. So again, stereotyping with an eth ethnicity can often steer people towards a certain activity depending on where they come from. So for example, people of African or origin can often be associated with athletics rather than swimming. Equally, people who come from Great Britain, from a white background, may be more inclined to be stereotypically footballers or rugby players rather than badminton players or long distance runners. And kind of linking with stereotyping is discrimination. 
People of certain ethnicity have faced discrimination in the past, such as racism, whilst playing a certain sport. And obviously this can put other people off. It could put those people off. And we've seen campaigns such as Show Racism, the red card in football, hopefully trying to reduce discrimination, but it does exist. So, a typical exam question on engagement patterns might look like this, and here we have some data analysis. So the graph on the right shows different levels of participation between males and females, and you need to explain the trends being shown. Trends basically means the pattern. So what is the graph showing us? And it's worth six marks. So the first thing we need to be looking at is, is this trends, and then we'll come on to explaining it. So if we look at the graph, the trend shows that males, the blue column, take part in more sport than females. That's the general relationship in terms of participation. A second trend also shows that participation of both genders, male and female, declines as people get older. So now we've got to talk about those two points. So participation may be higher for males due to having them more sporting opportunities, more clubs available, better social acceptance, so it's seen more socially acceptable for boys to take part in sport than girls. And there's less stereotyping. So some people consider boys should be playing sport and girls shouldn't. And as we've discussed before, that's a wrongful, wrongful perception, but some people still have it. To discuss the second trend about gender declining as age increases, we're talking about family and work commitments. So as people get older, commitments start to get bigger and more complex, such as family and work. There's increased financial commitment, so you've got to pay for bills, so you might not have that disposable income to pay for uh, gym, things of that nature. And as we get older, our fitness can reduce, and that can put some people off taking part in sport. So that little answer there would take up about six marks. Obviously, I would expect you to write in a little bit more detail, but this is a snapshot. So we're moving on to commercialization in sport now. Commercialization is basically turning a sporting activity into a business to make money. It could be an activity like football in the Premier League, but it could be simple, something as simple as uh, your local gym who charges a subscription for you to go in and to make some money off that. So, here we have something called the Golden Triangle. Now, the Golden Triangle relates to how sport uses media to make money and how media uses sport to make money and how they're all interlinked with one another and they help one another. And I'm going to give you an example of that now. So, if we think about Sky Sports as our media source, probably the biggest media uh, company in the entire world, Sky Sports gives money to the Premier League. The Premier League then gives that money to successful sports teams. Okay? Those successful sport teams have fans who want to watch those games on TV, who then pay money to Sky. And as you can see there, there is a real correlation between these different entities from the media source, Sky Sports, giving money to the Premier League, who then give it to the club, and then obviously the fans of that club want to watch them, so will then pay money to Sky. Without one of those particular elements not being involved, then the other one would fall down. If the media didn't give money to the Premier League, the Premier League couldn't give it to the clubs, the clubs wouldn't have as much success, and therefore they wouldn't have as big a fan base. So again, you can see how one would break down without the other. Now, there's many different benefits of commercialization for different elements of that. So for the media companies, obviously they make huge amounts of money by charging viewer subscription fees or pay-per-view. As a result of loads of people watching Sky Sports, companies want to sponsor events. So again, they get more money from different sponsorships. The product, so it might be the Premier League is associated with Sky Sports, or something like Barclays Bank sponsoring the Premiership means that they are associated with a high-quality brand. And the media source is integral to the running of a high-quality sport, which gives them a sense of responsibility. The benefits for the sport, so again I've used football here, obviously there's huge amounts of investment as a result of the media company. They get their sport shown all over the world, it attracts the best players 
And as a result of that, encourages more people to get involved, like Joe Public. Young people at school want to play football because they've seen on TV. They want to become like the best person that they've seen in their team. And equally, money can be passed on to grassroots football, so local amateur clubs. For the players of these teams, then commercialisation is brilliant because they earn vast amounts of money. They are full-time professionals, so they can train and play full-time, better performers. They'll receive top quality products from all the sponsors because their sponsors want to be seen on Sky Sports wearing the best boots and then young people go out and buy them. And again, it encourages others to participate. So if Neymar's playing for PSG or Barcelona, whoever he's playing for at the time, then other people might play football as a result of that. Now, for me and you as the public, the benefits of commercialisation is that we get to see our favourite sport on TV more often. And we get to see our club getting more success because of commercialization because get, they're getting more money they're attracting the better players equally we're getting to see more technology in sport so on sky sports for example we can pause we can rewind we can see player interviews we can see behind the scenes we can see goal line technology and all that's come from the media companies and equally we're able to purchase products similar to our favorite club players or so shirts boots whatever it may be however Commercialization can also have some negative issues with it. With regards to the media company, these big media companies can dictate what and who is shown on their channels. So football is the biggest sport shown on Sky Sports, whereas something such as badminton is not shown that often. Therefore, they're dictating what is the more popular sports because they're visualizing it on their media channels more than others. They can influence rule and format changes. So again, if we think about football, prior to Sky Sports, all football matches used to kick off at 3 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. As a result of Sky Sports, football now kicks off at 12.30, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, Monday night, Sunday afternoon, Saturday, Fridays, and they've dictated that. And the payment for these channels limits the number of people who can view sport. So again, they are dictating who gets to watch this sport because not everyone can afford to pay for Sky Sports. For the sport itself, well, the sport is heavily reliant on this investment. And if that investment stopped, then the sports, such as the Premier League, would probably collapse. Some sports don't get shown as others, so less money is paid into those sports and therefore participation is reduced. So as I said, badminton, for example, doesn't get a lot of presence on Sky Sports, therefore it doesn't get as much money, therefore there's not as much investment. It can create a divide between sports. So as I say, one sport gets more coverage than the other, one athlete gets more coverage than the other, and not all rule changes benefit the sport. So if we think about rugby league, for example, or rugby union, or even football now, when we've got this goal line technology, it takes away that element of doubt. And for some supporters, they enjoyed that. That was the discussion point. But now it's all factual. There's a break in the game. We've got to check every different element of it. And obviously some little bits of information that may have been missed previously and not now. And therefore, it's very black and white. For the player... As you probably know, money becomes more important than the sport or than the club. Players move at the drop of a hat now, and it's all based on money generally. There is a huge amount of pressure on players who are getting all these thousands of pounds to play, and with that comes fame, but equally no privacy. They have to advertise the products that are directed by the club and the league. So obviously, in that picture there, we've got Neymar. He's got Fly Emirates on his shirt. He may have had a bad experience with Fly Emirates, but he's still got to to show that he's supporting them. And poor performances ultimately, ultimately can lead to a loss of employment. If someone's not performing, managers are probably the, the biggest susceptible people to this. If they're not performing in two or three games, then they could lose their job. For us as Joe Public, as we said before, not everyone can afford to pay the subscriptions. Uh, people do not bother really going to watch or play the sport live now because they'd rather watch Sky Sports than going out and actually doing it themselves. And as a result of that, that's leading to reduced participation and more people leading an unhealthy lifestyle. So the exam question or a common exam question that you might see is to look at commercialization and the impact it's had on a particular sport. So here we're looking at why women's football has not experienced the same level of success as men's football due to commercialization. So 
uh, the answer I've started with here is looking at the lack of investment. Um, so men's football gets a huge amount of investment compared to women's football. And therefore, men can be full-time players who are highly sponsored. And therefore, you can create professional leagues from that. Women are not so lucky at that. There are a few clubs who are going down the professional route, but it's a long way from the men's game so far. There's not as much media coverage of female football. It's not publicised enough. So young football female players may not have the role models or the inspiration that young boy football players do. Male football is st still dominating uh, most football in the media. So it could create discrimination against women wanting to play football. It's not necessarily considered to be a women's based sport because all we see in the media generally is male football players being publicised. And due to the lack of investment in women's football at the top of the game, the grassroots amateur clubs don't receive the same financial backing. Uh, and then obviously that would create a bit of a gap in the market, whereas male football clubs feed that financial uh, investment down into the amateur clubs, whereas it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case with girls football. Our final topic then is looking at ethical and social cultural issues in sport and primarily we're looking at the conduct, behaviour and values associated with sport. For this we're going to look at three areas. We're going to look at sportsmanship, gamesmanship and deviance and we're going to look at basically what those three topics mean and examples of how and why these elements happen within sport. So sportsmanship is obviously displaying good conduct, playing within the rules, playing fairly. Gamesmanship is, is a difficult one to actually consider because it's not actually breaking the rules, but it's bending the rules to gain an unfair advantage. However, deviance is purposefully breaking the rules of an event so that you are winning at all costs. And which are sportsmanship. So we can see here the images of the American football squad and the images of the soccer player are examples of sportsmanship, whereas the four images in the middle are gamesmanship. Athletes who are bending the rules, not necessarily breaking the rules, in order to gain an unfair advantage. Deviance in sport is the opposite end of that. So this is purposely breaking the rules of an event or a sport in order to win at all costs. Um, good examples of this are in cycling and athletics often when people use performance enhancing drugs in order to win at all costs. Generally the reasons they do this is to, to win, uh, whether it be win medals, win titles, win prizes, because if they do that it increases their fame and as a result they get increased sponsorship which then leads to more money. The consequences however, uh, we have two areas really, we have game related sanctions so things like football or rugby, you get sin binned or you can get banned uh, if you get caught cheating. Um, but even more extreme than that, we have things like financial fines. So money getting taken off you as a result of your poor behaviour. Sponsorship can be taken away from you. And in some cases, people can even be sent to prison. Prevention wise, uh, sports are doing quite a lot to, to stop deviance in sport. Things such as drug testing and national campaigns are out there. And they're also using technology and independent review panels who will look at games, look at performances and try and highlight any areas of deviance and then try and impose some bans from there. A typical question that you might see in an exam, um, explain using examples why some athletes use gamesmanship when they perform. Worth five marks this. So again, start it off with what gamesmanship is. Give a definition. So it's bending the rules to gain an unfair advantage. And then we've got four more marks to get from explaining and giving examples. So an athlete may, may bend the rules in order to distract their opponents so that they lose focus and then for performance deteriorates. A good example of this is in cricket where they use sledging, where the fielders or the wicketkeeper talk to the batsman in order to put him off. Another reason is to gain a tactical advantage. So in football, for example, somebody might dive that might force the referee to award a free kick or a penalty. And then if the referee does that, your team are then in a better position to either score or relieve some defensive pressure. And finally, one other reason is to combat natural inability. If your opponents are naturally better than you, whether it be skill-wise, fitness-wise, people often use gamesmanship to balance things up. So, as I say, that was a very quick 
overview of four topics. Um, if you have any further questions, then obviously you can continue to email me directly. But if not, I hope that helped you and I look forward to welcoming you to our A-level course next week. Thank you and goodbye.